Welcome to Ideation Collective. I'm Jess Larson. Today, we're on part two of our episode with Nick Simmons. Absolutely invaluable. You can't even put a price on it without having someone to run thoughts by. Not just someone, but multiple people, an advisory, a life advisory board. You know, I just, it's, I don't know how people get through the day. I'm so lucky to have my parents who are still around and, and uh, have a great relationship with my coach, who's been my mentor for the last 20 years. My sports psychologist, you know, there are there are so many things that come up in life that can derail what you're working towards. This is another episode of our innovation and leadership series where we interview pro athletes, world-class musicians, CEOs, Hollywood filmmakers, and a wide variety of other high achievers. Before we get rolling, I want to invite you to get involved with Child Rescue, the charity our founder started. To learn more about them, just come to our website, iCollective.co, and check on the Child Rescue tab on our menu. Also, I want to talk to you about one of our show's sponsors. I met these guys back on episode six. CEO Zach Smith was telling me all about starting a skateboard company and how much he hated doing the bookkeeping uh, for a skateboard shop and how he really uh, got led to start this business, Bookly, that's a hybrid combining bookkeeping software and human services. And I'll tell you why I let him become a sponsor. It's because I use their service now. I don't love paying 50 bucks an hour for bookkeepers to do stuff that I know software could do way, way cheaper, but uh, I don't love bookkeeping at all. So I want a real live human who knows what they're talking about to help me with the stuff I don't understand. Uh, Probably the straw that broke the camel's back for me though, the thing that put me over the top was that they could do my taxes and payroll also. Um, So totally suggest checking them out. Go to their website, bookly.co and check out their flat rates. I've been super happy with them. So now on to today's episode. Two-time Olympian, professional runner, um, CEO of RunGum. um, And Nick, well, anybody who didn't listen to part one, I really think you should hear about Nick's experience qualifying for the Olympic teams and and the ways that willpower has learned, that he learned in running has transferred to other parts of his life. But for everybody who doesn't know what RunGum is, can you give us just the, the quick the quick ones over for somebody that missed the last episode. Yeah, definitely. Run gum's the future of the energy market. It is everything that's in a sugar-free energy drink distilled down, compressed into two pieces of chewing gum. I love the way energy drinks make me feel from an emotional standpoint, from a cognitive standpoint, but the way it sits in my stomach is absolutely horrible. And so I knew I wanted the stimulants, caffeine, taurine, and B vitamins. I wanted to get them in a, in a sugar-free, calorie-free way that would allow me to boost my performance without having anything in my stomach. And that's why I took those stimulants and put them into two pieces of chewing gum. And we sell them at rungum.com and, and at uh, 300 retailers throughout the United States. It's, uh, it's a cleaner, more efficient, more affordable way to get your performance-enhancing stimulants. And, and on the last episode, you talked about legal performance-enhancing stimulants, and you didn't mean the law is legal. You meant the sports rules legal, right? Yeah, that's the world we play in. We're governed by two uh, entities, WADA, the World Anti-Doping Administration, USADA. And they have very strict rules on what we can and cannot ingest. Uh, And they are a lot of athletes that don't feel they need to play by those rules. Uh, My coach and I have always wanted to do it the right way. And there are stimulants that have been scientifically shown to have performance enhancing abilities. Uh, especially in endurance athletics, namely caffeine, taurine, and B vitamins. And those are the stimulants that are legal in, in my sport, and those are the stimulants we've chosen to put in run gum. Sure. Um, speaking of stimulants, you know, we were talking about in the last episode how, as CEO, you work to um, be the best version of yourself when you're coming into office in the morning and how running regulates your mood. Um, I'm interested, have you heard of this guy, John uh, Raddy at... Harvard. Uh, He's got that book, Spark, talks about how exercise is so valuable for your thinking, like leave alone like the body health benefits, Uh, talking about the chemicals that it releases that changes Mm -hmm. the way you think. Have you heard of this guy? I haven't, but I 100 percent believe in it. Um, It's, uh, you know, anecdotally, I'm interested if if you feel like you've seen that anywhere in your life of the times when you're on your game workout wise if if you feel like that's giving you mental clarity or or you feel like better ideas or anything like that i mean every one of my great ideas has come when i was on a run by myself it is such a incredible way to to focus and and just to calm everything else so that you can actually be creative and allow your mind to flow and i have no idea what chemicals are being released in my body 
uh, what's allowing me to have those thoughts. But uh, I actually keep a journal right next to my uh, running gear. And that whenever I get back from a run, I, I jot down the ideas that I had on the run. And that's how Run Gum was born. It was run. It was born while I was on the run. You know, many of the marketing ideas that I've had have come when I was out running. Any of these hard problems that I'm having trouble figuring out, if I just lace up my shoes and go out for an hour and run along the trail, more often than not, I'm able to work them out. And again, I don't know what the biomechanical process is, but there's definitely something to be said for that. Mm. You know, it makes me, I'm a real book nerd, but it, it makes me think of another book, um, by Andrew Smart called called Autopilot, The Art mm -hmm. and Science of, do, of Doing Nothing. Mm -hmm. And basically, in the recent years, they came up with some new neural discoveries. Um, they had some patients in fMRI machines measuring, hey, what part of the brain lights up when we do this? What part when he lights up when you do that? And when they had the patients not doing anything, this other part of the brain was lighting up, and the researchers thought the equipment was broken. Mm. But what they found out as a result of investigating it is that they call it your default, your default mo node network. Uh, mm -hmm. That basically, that part of your brain oscillates and processes what's going on the rest of the time. Um, the conscious parts of our brain, the things we're actively thinking about, that when we're not doing anything, that that's when that gets processed. And oh, interesting. It's only been in the last handful of years. Last handful of years, they've they've really confirmed all this. But then they go back anecdotally through how many discoveries, like Newton figuring out physics uh, of gravity while sitting in a park or sitting in a garden, right? And over and over, how many of like the the best philosophical and science ideas have been thought up while somebody was on a walk, while somebody was on a run? And it's kind of like the science of why that would be the time when your brain could take all of these other things that are happening in conscious, intentional work and process it into a discovery and, you know, remix it in your brain. So yeah, anyways, makes sense. scientifically, it makes a ton of sense why you would come up with those ideas on a run. Yeah. And I know marketing firms that when they're stuck on a problem, they'll say, Hey, that, let's just close our binders. We're going to go out and we're going to go walk along the river for an hour. And it, it just shifting the environment causes you to think in a different way, maybe not in a better way, but just a different way. And sometimes the different, uh, is the different perspective is what allows you to get yourself outside of that box and come up with a solution to a problem that you may have. Yeah. Um, hey, listen, we, we love to ask all our guests about any book recommendations they have. Are there any that any books that stand out to you? Yeah. You know, one that jumps out is, is Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. And it, I don't know that I, w I don't want to say it's outdated. I think I read this maybe five years ago, but it's really what gave me uh, the, the confidence that I could be an entrepreneur. It was just, it made it seem so doable that anyone could become an entrepreneur, that anyone could kind of life hack their way out of their problems. And uh, I don't know if you've read it. I think probably a lot of mm -hmm. your listeners have, but it just, uh, it erased a lot of self doubt. And I think self doubt is probably the most cancerous thing that an entrepreneur could ever have. And ever since I read that book, it just seemed like somehow I'm going to be able to figure my way out of any problem. Uh, the way that Tim describes his process of figuring his way out of problems. Hmm. You know, I think that book has had a big influence on a lot of people. And yet, I think there's a lot of people who like listen to his podcast these days and haven't gotten around to reading the book. Yeah. Um, that I, I think would be, that's, I mean, that's where he got famous for a reason. It's a <laughs> phenomenal book. Well, any so I like that one a lot. Um, yeah. uh, another one that comes to mind is rich dad, poor dad. Did you ever read that? Mm -hmm. I think that the way that a person thinks about money is extremely important to the kind of businessman or entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneur that they, they might one day be. Uh, and Rich Dad, Poor Dad was one of the first books on money that I really read. And you got to understand that money can work against you or money can work for you. And, and there's a dozen different ways that can do both. And until you understand what money is and what it means and how it can help you or hurt you, uh, it's it's not worth pursuing. You really need to understand what it is before you decide to devote your life towards moving it around. Well, and you know, I, I think about that book and how some people feel like, um, you know, it's not the most sophisticated of business books ever written, right? Oh, certainly not. And, no, it's written for the masses. And I'll, I'll say, though, um, his the next one in that series, the Cashflow Quadrants book, um, mm -hmm. to me, it does something, you know, for, for as many people as um, maybe look down their nose at like how it's not, you know, Harvard PhD language, right? Um we do a really poor job, at least in the West, of separating the difference between entrepreneurs who trade their hours for dollars 
and entrepreneurs mm-hmm. that build a system that works independent of them spending their hours. Yeah. And those are such different sports that if, uh, they're, if they're you want two the, totally different existences, aren't they? Well, but the problem comes in that if you want the results of the kind of people that get, you know, the kind of revenue that duplication can provide, you know, when it's not mm-hmm. dependent on you being there, but you invest your time and effort and learning into a system that requires you to be physically present Mm-hmm. It is exceedingly <laughs> unlikely to produce the results of a yeah. business system if you are the system, right? Absolutely. No, the, the, the thing that jumps out to mind, and I don't, it might have been Rich Dad, Poor Dad where I read this, but you want to find a way to make money when you sleep. If you can do that, you're never going to have to worry about money. You know, And it's really – it's extremely ha- hard to find a way to disassociate income from hours spent. Uh, but I always – really loved the idea of my time not being traded for dollars because time's the most valuable asset we have. Right. And, and to trade that for dollars, it always scared me, I guess that's how I'd put that. Yeah. You know, and so many people say that, but if you follow their actions, they have signed up for something where they have to trade their hours for dollars. Right. And, and have to, and choosing to are two different things. Like (laughs) some, some people might call me a hypocrite. They say, Nick, what are you talking about? You're out there working eight, 50 hours a week on run gum. And I say to them, no, I'm choosing to do that. That's it's a, it's pleasurable for me. Yeah. But if you're building now, a distribution system where somebody else manufactures the gum and somebody else drives it across the country for you, yeah. you have the potential to create a system, right? Absolutely. And that's what we're working towards. So I actually think this is a good place to pause for just a minute to tell you about one of our show sponsors. I was actually pretty excited when Skillshare reached out. You know, a lot of our listeners know I'm a real learning nerd, really into the audiobooks and things like this. And these guys have a ton of great classes. Um, There's like 16,000 classes on their website, but you only pay one monthly price. You don't have to pay per class like a number of the services out there. So it's unlimited access with a low monthly price kind of thing. But the, the breadth of the classes and the quality of them, I'm actually really impressed with. I was on there for just a few minutes and I had like a dozen classes I've, I've saved to take. There's stuff on social media marketing, mobile photography, logo design, just all sorts of things for growing a business or creative things. Um, and what's nice is they're letting me give away a free month. Um, if you go to Skillshare.com slash leader, uh, you can get a free month. Um, the class that I would recommend for sure right off the bat, though, is from Seth Godin. I'm a big Seth Godin fan, read all his books. A lot of my friends are, too. But he's got a class on there called the Modern Marketing Workshop that I, I really could not recommend enough. It's I actually think it's better than a number of his books because it's super broken down, specific how-tos, answer this question for yourself, make a plan, write it down. Um, it's not as much general uh, marketing advice. It's like specific. You need to do stuff different if you watch this. Anyways, skillshare.com slash leader, get a free month. There's tons of stuff on there worth checking out. But, but uh, my personal recommendation, the Modern Marketing Workshop by Seth Godin is the one that uh, I think you should at least check out. Anyways, let's get back in the interview. Um, yeah, you know, back to the Tim Ferriss one um, for our work week. You know, I think a lot of people have gotten different things from that book over the years. But for me, uh, the book was impactful to me because um, one of the guys, one of the stories he tells in there about the kid who joined the other Olympic team for the Olympic mm-hmm. ski team, that was, yeah. my, that was my buddy's roommate. And so I oh, felt really? like this connection to it. And so I was yeah. <laughs> got invested in the book. But I think one of the things that stood out to me is he said, like, the old way of getting rich is um, making a ton of money so that you can buy things that you don't want to impress people you don't really care about. Exactly. And I thought, man, I will say a lot of my entrepreneurial ambition was for, like, self-focused reasons at the time. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was going to prove – I was going to prove to the world that I mattered because I was going to become so rich or something, right? Yeah. And to me, that was like this gut check because here is an entrepreneur. He's not saying entrepreneurship is bad, but he is a, he is questioning this like self-focused the motivation motivation thing. And yeah. and that I, I felt like that's something that um, was one of the steps in me choosing this lifestyle for less yeah. of a self-focused reason over time. You know? Yeah, absolutely. No, and and uh, what I was talking about, you know, how one views money earlier. You know, money to me equals freedom. It's it's being able to pursue the things I want to do. I, I live a really simple life. I uh, I live in a tiny 500 square foot apartment. I drive a 2007 uh, pickup truck that's that's absolutely beat to crap. And I could go out and, and buy whatever I wanted to with cash, but I don't want to. I love this simple lifestyle. 
And so for me, when I say I want to make Rungum a billion dollar company, it's not because I want to go out and buy a Bugatti. It's because I wanted, I honestly, truly am just curious if I have what it takes to do that. When I launched Rungum, it wasn't uh, dreaming of buying a you know, $12 million mansion. I would be too stressed out to ever own a house like that. I really just want to say to myself, do I have what it takes? Just like in track and field or mountain climbing. Do I have what it takes to break four minutes in the mile? No one, you know, I'm not doing it to impress anybody. I just truly want to know if I have what it takes to reward myself, you know, with that absolute rush of endorphins when I accomplish a goal that I didn't think I could do. When I stand on top of a mountain that I looked at and said, I really don't know if I can physically do that, but I somehow find a way to do it. It's not for anyone else. It's truly for me. And I guess that's kind of how I view entrepreneurial business. But it's taken me a long time to understand that about myself. I'm not saying that I, I, I came to that realization overnight. It was, it was through a lot of self-reflection and, and talking to a sports psychologist who I work with very closely and my business partner and family as well. You know, you've talked about your coach a number of times. You talked about the sports psychologist. Um, in your mind, what's the value of having an advisor like that that you can be safe enough to, to ask those hard questions with? I mean, it's it's absolutely invaluable. You can't even put a price on it without having someone to run thoughts by. Not just someone, but multiple people. An advisory, a life advisory board. You know, I just it's I don't know how people get through the day. I'm so lucky to have my parents, who are still around and and uh, have a great relationship with my coach, who's been my mentor for the last 20 years. My sports psychologist. You know, there are there are so many things that come up in life that can derail what you're working towards. Mm -hmm. And without without being able to talk talk it out with somebody, it's easy to overreact. And my mom always says, "Life's what happens when you're making plans," and it's it's really true. You're throwing curveballs all the time, and it's it's those people that that have those friends and mentors and and advisors to lean on in in those tough times that are able to take a deep breath and find a way around the obstacles that are coming their way. You know, th this is a subject I've thought a lot about, um, and I'm interested in your opinions. Why do you think it is that, you know, and let's talk about specifically either your coach or your sports psychologist. Um, well, first, on the sports psychologist, you know, um, there's so many, you know, the idea of a psychiatrist or a psychologist has a lot of stigma in America. Um, it seems like an advantage to be able to have a sports psychologist because now all of a sudden you get those benefits without the stigma. Well, I'll say that there shouldn't be a stigma because mm -hmm. talk, being able to talk to somebody and being truly honest with somebody is just it's very, very rewarding. And I started working with a sports psychologist because I was angry, not because I was having trouble winning. In fact, I was pretty much, you know, in my mid twenties winning almost every race that I ran. So I kind of had this this idea that whatever I was doing was right, you know, in terms of training and preparation and visualization. But I was angry and I just didn't know why I was so mad when I was so successful and I, I needed to talk that out with somebody. And it was the kind of thing that I didn't feel comfortable talking with my parents about. And in some ways, even my coach, I needed someone that had absolutely no vested interest in my career that would just give me an honest perspective. And, mm -hmm. and in talking with him and, and understanding where the root of my sadness or anger was coming from, I was able to correct it and, and not sacrifice performance, which was the big key. I wanted to make sure that the that those frustrations that were eating me alive weren't the caught weren't weren't the source of my success, which I was really worried about. Mm. Uh, but I was able to address some of the the emotional issues that I was having without sacrificing performance in any way. And in fact, when I addressed them and dealt with some of the things that were frustrating me, my performance actually improved, which is really where a sports psychologist you know comes so comes in handy. You know, um, we had an NHL player on the show, Brad Mills, who, who, anyways, had a similar approach to his opinion of how his mental state impacted his physical game. Um, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on this, too, because uh, I feel like I've observed this. But why do you think it is that having someone objective to listen to is so valuable when we have these people that we love and that love us? That sometimes it doesn't seem like we can have the same conversation with them. Well, that this we is have truly why. Objective. This, and in my, I'm speaking to my personal experience. Mm. But when you talk to anyone that's close to you in your life, you're gonna, you're, it's gonna be biased. You are going to give them a certain version of what you really mean. When I talk to my mom, I don't tell her some of the deep, dark thoughts that I'm having because I don't want to make my mom sad. I don't want to burden her with that. Uh, but when I'm talking to Jeff Trosh, my sports psychologist. I can tell him some of the crazy shit that I'm thinking. Sorry, crazy stuff that I'm thinking. 
uh, because because he's not my mom. It's not going to burden him. It's it, I'm, mm-hmm. it's his it's his job to be burdened by some of these things. And I remember when I first started working with him, I said, Jeff, I want you to know that I'm going to be so brutally honest with you uh, to the point that you might not want to work with me after murders. You might think that I'm just messed up beyond repair or you know, I have these crazy thoughts and they're not that crazy. I understand now that the thoughts I was having were just the thoughts that every 25 year old kid has. And, and I said, but I know that the only way this is going to be beneficial for me is if I'm, if I was, if I'm absolutely 100% honest with you and I don't spin it in any way, I just tell you who I am and we sort it out, the sort out the mess afterwards. And it was scary, uh, really scary actually telling somebody that thoughts that I'd never told anybody else that I was having and getting that honest feedback and Mm -hmm. a professional is paid to to be a sin eater is what I used to think. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, t- I'm telling this guy my sins and what what it makes me angry about myself or about my predicament. And he gets paid to listen to that and burden himself with it and then work through the problems with me. And it was just, it was really great for me at the time. And, yeah. you know, the, the, I was angry about the state of track and field. I was angry about uh, where I was living and, and, you know, the situation I was in. And they were really the kind of things that are so easy to work through if you're just honest with people about where, where, how you're feeling and and what what you think is making you feel that way. Yeah. You know, switching gears, talking about your coach, um, it sounds like you've got a big amount of respect for that guy. I do. He, I, I call him my coach, but he's actually, believe it or not, in 20 years, never written a workout for me. Uh, so I met him at Willamette. He was the strength and conditioning coach there. And I just I connected with him really well, uh, even though he wasn't coaching me. And he, I just he's a successful businessman and had a beautiful wife and, and three great kids. And I'm like, man, this guy's got it figured out. I just want to know everything that he knows. And so I kind of, you know, followed him around at track meets and and whenever we were flying to a track meet, I'd sit on the plane and pick his brain. And he kind of took me under his wing, and we ended up going on to win seven NCAA titles and and make a dozen world teams, including two Olympic teams. That, so I still call him Coach Sam, but at this point, he's my best friend and my business partner. But for a long time, he was really my mentor, and he taught me everything I know about business and everything you know about loving people for who they are and just my place in the world. Aside from my parents, you know, Coach Sam has taught me more about about myself and about this world than anybody else. Um, thinking about that, you know, so many of us in our work relationships. Um, you know, to be a great CEO, to be a great manager, it almost seems like the best version are these people who are like, they are, it's almost like they're a player coach, you know, where it's like, mm-hmm. they're somewhat involved in our work, or um, at least they're tied to it. But it's, it's an ongoing thing. And they do have a vested interest, right? So there's this, there's this element of self regulating, where if someone's going to be, you know, a boss coach, right? there's this element where you're supposed to be guiding and then there's this element where you're supposed to be letting them learn. <laughs> Any thoughts on, you know, you've, you've got a team, um, you're running your company. Any thoughts on, as you try to be like coach Sam for your, <laughs> for your staff of like how, any kind of like, what's your philosophy for knowing when to guide and when to let them grow? Well, I think there's a lot of different ways to lead and, there's the kind of leader that barks orders and there's the kind of leader that sits back and, and quietly leads by example. And I, I guess I've always kind of wanted to be in the trenches with my team, if that makes sense. So I'm not out front leading and saying, follow me in this noble endeavor. It just sounds pompous. And I've also not been the one to just kind of, you know, sit back and observe quietly. I want to be in there. I want to know, you know, what, what, what people are angry about. If someone if something's bothering somebody, I want to know about it right now because we can address it, you know, really quickly and nip it in the bud. So when I'm at, I live in Seattle right now, and my team is based in Eugene at, at uh, Corporate HQ, and it's really frustrating. We use uh, a couple different, you know, teleconference, tele, or go-to meeting type applications to connect every day. But when I'm back in the warehouse uh, one week a month, I am doing every single aspect of the business to try to understand it better. Just because I'm the CEO doesn't mean I'm not down in the warehouse packing boxes sometimes, because I want to know what's going on down there. I want to know, you know, if, if the guys that are fulfilling orders are happy, if there's something that they need, uh, I want to, and, and not only that, it's one of the most rewarding part of the jobs as you see the product actually being fulfilled and being shipped out to all corners of the United States. And uh, we're still a small team, which really allows me to, to be able to do things like that. But I hope that as we grow, 
that authenticity and that sincerity is is able to be a part of our company because I really do believe that a leader that that especially a CEO I think a CEO has to be able to see every single cog in the machine to know if that machine is running as well as possible. Yeah. Well, listen, I know we're kind of closing up here, but um, we'd like to ask people advice that our charity, Child Rescue, Train to Prevent Child Sex Trafficking. If you had advice for us on how to get more people involved in a cause like that, get the word out, um, what, what kind of advice would you have for us? Well, this will sound a bit biased, but celebrity endorsement is one of the best ways that I've ever found to get a message out. Uh, I work really closely with a charity called Smile Train. It's a, a charity based in New York, a 501c3 based in New York that fixes cleft palates throughout the world. And I think one in 100 children is it that are born? No, maybe not that much, but a certain percentage of the population is born with a cleft palate in third world countries. Uh, it's an operation that costs $250 to fix, and many children never get this fixed because they, they can't afford it. And it's just such a simple thing that changes a person's life absolutely for the better and in and, and radical, incredible ways. And it, and they just – it was this organic relationship where I just wrote a check one day, and then they reached out to me uh, when they saw that I was you know an Olympian with a decent social media following. And we've been working closely ever since. And you know, I think that you can't underestimate the power of social media, and there are so many celebrities out there who are desperate to be part of something bigger. You know, so many track and field athletes I know who are so bored and want to be part of something more important than running around in circles, and they just need to find that thing that resonates with them. And you know, the charity that you guys are working uh, with or, or working for is, it sounds like it's a phenomenal organization that anybody uh, would want to get involved with. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, there is something about those people that we admire, it's easy to admire what they admire, right? Yeah, it's, it's human nature. Um, by the way, you know, 60,000 followers on Instagram, 40,000 on Facebook, um, 60,000 on Twitter. What, what do you attribute that to? Like, did you actively, did you actively create that or was it more a, a function of your other successes? No, I had to work pretty hard at it and it's, it's, it's counterintuitive to my nature. I'm a very private person. I grew up in Idaho and I'm, I'm most happy when I'm out on a mountain or fishing far away from people. <laughs> But I understand that my part of my job as a professional athlete is to interact with my fan base. And what better way to do that than through social media? And I, you know, I'm a millennial and an, an older millennial at that. So I grew up with, you know, social media becoming so important. I, I was around when you had to have a .edu address to have a Facebook account. So I really have truly seen this from the very beginning. And I, I understood the power of social media early on. And I understood that in order to be one of the more liked and more or at least what more well-known athletes then i had to be willing to share myself with my fans and whether it was through facebook or instagram or twitter i tried to really show people who i am and the things that are important to me on and off the track and i think that that being willing to to be open uh, about a lot of different subjects is what allowed my my fan base to grow you know relatively large for the world of track and field yeah um well listen we appreciate all time you spent with us um any other parting advice you'd want to leave with? We've covered a lot of bases. Um, you know, I, I think I, I just want to touch again on self-doubt because for entrepreneurs or athletes or anyone, if you think that I'm sitting here and pontificating and telling you that I never have self-doubt, then I would be lying to you, and that's just not the case. I think that I have found really effective people and, and maneuvers and ways to deal with my own self-doubt. And if, if you can minimize that, the world's your oyster. There's nothing you can't accomplish if you believe that you can do it. Awesome. Well, uh, being that you actually made it to the Olympics twice on that and all those national championships, <laughs> up, I think that, I, that I, you know, some people say that cliche wise, I think you kind of prove it's true. So well, thank you. Um, okay. Thanks for making time for this. Thank you. It's great questions. And that was part two of our interview. If you missed part one, please go back an episode and download the episode before this one for the first half of the interview. As always, please check iCollective.co for show notes of things referenced during the interview and to learn more about our guest. And if you're interested, we'd love to have you learn more about the charity Child Rescue. Go to the menu page on iCollective and click on Child Rescue. Thanks so much.